Welcome to A Watershed Moment, the community media program that celebrates the rivers and connected lands forming the natural circulatory system of our region. The health of these watersheds is intricately tied to that of the humans who live here and affect them. So we invite you to come along as we explore the natural landscape, observe the wildlife, and share the beauty minutes away from our homes and daily commutes. This series will introduce you to the organizations and to the passionate volunteers, organizers, recreationists, athletes, and scientists who work tirelessly to sustain and improve these watersheds. So we have today uh, the Executive Director, Patrick Heron of the Mystic River Watershed Association. And I'm Charlotte Pierce. I'm the producer of this series. And I would like to uh, get a sense. You know, I know there, the watershed associations are key to the health of this ecological system and we want to do what we can to uh, support what you do. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the mission of the Mystic uh, River Watershed Association and you know a, a bit of history and, and we'll have a discussion about it and then we'll bring your scientist in, uh, Andy Racina later. Great, well, Charlotte, I just wanna thank you and your team for shining a light on our watershed and neighboring watersheds. Our organization is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1972 to protect and restore the Mystic River, its tributaries, and all the land around it for both the present and as well as future generations, and to celebrate it, the value and the importance and the beauty of these resources. Um, while we started as an all-volunteer organization just about the time that the Clean Water Act was passed, we're now a professional organization that have uh, has 11 staff um, and involves uh, more than 1,500 volunteers a year uh, out in the parks and on the river and doing science um, to improve these uh, lands and this water so that we can all enjoy them. Um, and we do our part to create a healthy community. And what are the cities that are in, the towns and cities that are involved in this? Um, there are, uh, great question, there are, are 21 communities. So it's a long list, but I'll give you a broad swath of them. We'll see if I miss some, but uh, Wilmington, Wakefield, Burlington, Woburn, Winchester, uh, Lexington, Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge, uh, Melrose, Medford, Malden, Everett, Chelsea, uh, East Boston, as well as Charlestown, Winthrop, Revere, Somerville, uh, Cambridge, and Watertown. So I'm pretty close. I may have. Uh... That sounds like 21 to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so the Malden River is part of the Mystic watershed. I mean, how does this work together with the three, the Charles, the Mystic, and the Malden? I mean, does that. Are they all part of the same watershed or? Well, great question. There are three yeah. major watersheds that drain to Boston Harbor. And so uh, I'll start with the Mystic as one yes. of them. The Charles River watershed is another uh, uh, watershed that drains to Boston Harbor. And then the third is the Neponset River watershed. Um, the Malden River is one of the tributaries to um, the Mystic River watershed. Okay, so got this it. This may be a great point uh, to in, uh, put in a graphic that mm -hmm. shows both sort of the Boston area um, as well as uh, the Mystic uh, proper. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say briefly that uh, the Mystic River watershed is a really unique place. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a really exciting place for uh, its characteristics. It's both a freshwater as well as saltwater watershed. Um, it has communities that are really well resourced and communities that uh, have uh, a small amount of resources. Uh, it has communities that are among the most diverse um, in, the, in Massachusetts. Um, and we have areas that are uh, spectacular natural resource areas like the Mystic Lakes, as well as some of the most urbanized and densely populated areas, whether they're in Somerville and Everett and Chelsea, um, mm -hmm. with some of the largest businesses um, in the Boston area serving a role as the economic engine of Boston. And do you see that um, 
there is a greater awareness now of the need to preserve and sustain the the um, habitats and wildlife and and water quality. Do you think there's an increased? Is there a dedication to it, or does this kind of come and go with <laughs> the uh, winds of whoever's in charge of the you know? Oh, I mean, government. We and that's such a great question, Charlotte, and it, you can come at it from so many different um, angles. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, we just came out of a Trump administration and we're in the Biden administration. I won't surprise anybody that uh, the policies that are being put forward now and the funding toward the environment is different than it was in the past four years. And a focus on environmental justice, which is a critical uh, work that needs to happen in our watershed. Um, and we're also coming in a moment where uh, we were all in our homes and staying away from each other, but also a moment where people were streaming out into these parks because they needed an escape. Um, and so we saw so many people accessing the parks and the waters along the Mystic River. And probably what comes along with that is a greater recognition of these resources that were in their yeah. backyard. And we're in a moment where people, there's a greater appreciation for climate. Um, and the challenges that we face regionally as well as nationally and um, globally. And um, so I think people are looking at these same natural resources and thinking about how we can enhance them to create a more resilient uh, watershed and set of communities. And then finally, um, there's a new lens in all of this work as we're all thinking about equity uh, in a different way. And I'm mm -hmm. um, trying to broaden the set of communities that are involved in watershed associations um, and welcomed into the community that uh, is accessing these resources. And that's work that our organization is really. Yeah. Um, and so that building that resiliency in the watershed and and engaging the communities that are involved in in sustaining that. The, when we think about resilience of the watershed, it's not just about fish and property. It's really about people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so we also recognize that the Mystic River Watershed Association doesn't own any land. And so the work that we do really is in collaboration. Um, and we have formed a very strong collaboration with our uh, municipalities um, and, and formed that group called the Resilient Mystic Collaborative. And um, these municipalities have taken this opportunity to lead. And we're, role, we're there as staff to help catalyze and help uh, bring uh, to action some of the ideas that the municipalities are, are, are coming up with. But in general, uh, we're working on regional uh, projects that will protect our communities from greater precipitation in the future, from sea level rise and storm surges, as well as what's expected to be a much hotter climate in the future. Um, and so these communities will plan together. They're doing some modeling together, um, designing structures and green infrastructure together. Um, and we're doing science together, whether it's mapping heat uh, or mapping uh, where waters are flooding. Um, so it's a really exciting project, and that's the Resilient Mystic Collaborative, and it goes hand in hand with another initiative, our Mystic Greenways project, which is really trying to um, augment the park system along the edge of the river, so it really becomes a resource, and both for travel and recreation, as well as for storing water as these as this future comes upon us. You, your, so your staffing and your volunteer programs all are feeding into that effort as well, I assume. Yeah, that's that's right. There are a lot of ways that people can get involved in our work. And one of the most prominent roles that volunteers play is actually uh, doing some of the science that uh, underpins the investments and decisions that we make, both as an organization, uh, but uh, uh, for data that we share with the municipalities. And so our uh -huh. volunteers are collecting water quality data, um, we're currently recruiting people to uh, collect data on temperature, um, and people help us count fish, of course. Um, yeah, love counting fish. Um, 
can I ask you just about the inclusionary initiatives you might be promoting to bring people who normally wouldn't be walking along the Greenway? Or do you have like youth programs? You facilitate those kinds of things as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, we, I think one of the most powerful ways that we interact with communities um, is around these volunteer events and these science work that we do as volunteers. But we're also in the school system across the whole watershed in each of our communities. Uh, my colleague, Marion Miller, who's our educator, does extraordinary work meeting with students and talking about these issues, whether they're climate change, uh, water quality, stormwater, or litter. Um, and so that's one of the most powerful ways for us to interact with the next generation. Um, we're not preaching to the choir because it's really the general population in the classrooms. Um, so we're, we're, we're having access to families um, and sharing information um, that I think is really useful. Very cool. I love that. Yeah, I, no I noticed when I was walking my dog this uh, last year or along the lower Mystic Lakes, there were all these families that had come down from Medford, you know, and they were having, you know, just their, their kids splashing around in the water and stuff. And, you know, they were, and they were very good about, I mean, as time goes on, they got better at sort of taking the trash out and, you know, they were very receptive to, you know, suggestions about that too. So. Well, the great thing is that the water quality in the Mystic Lakes and the Mystic River really is excellent. Um, particularly, we, we encourage people to recreate um, uh -huh. during dry weather or when it hasn't rained for a few days. But during that warm months when it's been sunny, um, you know, the Mystic Lakes really can't be beat for the view, for the nature. Uh -huh. um, if you don't see river herring, you see bald eagles overhead. Um, so yeah. it, it really is wonderful. It's great. Well, let me ask you now, I, the, the herring is like the icon of the Mystic Lakes. I wanted to bring in, maybe bring in Andy Husina. Andy, uh, you're, you're the scientist uh, for the Mystic River Watershed Association. Is, am I correct about that? Um, that is my title. Um, I, I, I've learned from the best. Patrick Herring <laughs> is, um, is a PhD plant ecologist. So um, Okay. I'm not certainly not the only scientist on staff, but yes. Got it. So there, there's the the herring, the natural phenomenon of this migratory run that is is you know created the the notoriety around the herring. But then you also have a uh, fundraising event, the Mystic River Herring Run and Paddle. But we wanted to kind of first uh, explain just briefly talk about what the herring run is and how long has it been going on and the what have been the challenges and hindrances to it uh, over the years. Oh, sure. And I, I never tire of telling this story. <laughs> this is, we often um, say that there's an amazing um, wildlife migration on the scale of 750,000 individual uh, animals that migrate through from the ocean to the through the heart of Boston under the Tobin Bridge and up to um, to the Mystic Lakes up the Mystic River past Somerville and Arlington and Medford and um, but it's hidden because they're they're fish and they're underwater <laughs> and um, normally people can't see and witness and sort of appreciate the scale of this major migration. So, um, so yeah, so there are two, these are uh, so-called river herring. There are two species. There's blueback herring and alewife. And alewife, not coincidentally, is the name of the tea station yeah. and the brook um, and the reservation uh, in Cambridge and Arlington. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to the, um, I, I, for many, most of my life, didn't know what alewife referred to. Turns out to refer to this migratory fish that comes back every spring to, um, to this system. And um, it speaks to the sort of extraordinary abundance in the past of this fish. It used to be less super abundant fish. You know, the stories, those, you know, it's one of those fish that gets the stories told that you could walk over the backs of the herring to Cross the stream because they're so they were so. Uh, I didn't realize that the hair the alewife were were 
technically a herring. Yeah. Yeah. No. Of... And so it's these two closely related species. Um, they're also related to shad, which is another migratory species. Oh, yeah. But in any case, they they live in the ocean. Uh, most of the time, most of their lives, and most of the year. But mm -hmm. their um, adults re of reproductive age come back to spawn in fresh water. And this turns out to be this, this um, ability to move from salt water to fresh water or vice versa. Um, and the migratory uh, behavior mm -hmm. associated with it. Um, so they're migrating just the way bird migrations happen, you know, that you think of birds coming to uh, the northern forest to nest and then returning to Central America. These mm -hmm. are fish who live in the ocean and come to freshwater to spawn. Um, that behavior is very rare among fish species. There's, you know, I think 60,000 fish species and fewer than 1% show this ability to, in th this behavior of moving back between freshwater and saltwater. But in any case, they come. and Amazingly, and with a lot of um, fidelity, they come back to the river they were born in. They can detect the ke unique chemical uh, signal, wow. right? Of that's the, just so touching, you know. It, it's it's amazing, yeah. They're just they're, and and it's both it's, it's both uh, touching and um, just like awe inspiring. I it think. is. I mean, um, I thought that about salmon and steelhead. You know, I grew up on yeah, the West Coast, and I just exactly. um, like how do they even know like. Exactly. This little sense that they have, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and so you know the the big story in the mist is, is one of um, so again through this organized watershed in New England that we like to say these fish come back and there is a a, a story that's played out over over the past um, uh, several years since 2012 of ecological restoration so. Um, you were mentioning earlier that you, in 2008, were helping carry uh, river herring physically over the dam at Upper Mystic Lake. Mm -hmm. um, in 2012, that turns out to be a wonderful but inefficient way to move hundreds <laughs> of thousands of fish. Um, the efficient way to do it is to install a so-called fish ladder, and it, it's a bit yeah. hard to describe without pictures, but it, it it's a passage through the dam that allows fish to kind of swim upstream and get from one lake to the other. And um, in 2012, uh, that a new one was installed at Mystic Lakes. And in that same year, we collaborated, started collaborating uh, with the Division of Marine Fisheries in Massachusetts to count, literally count the fish that are, that are getting from one lake to the other. And we don't count, and I should say, by we, I mean volunteers who, who um, apply in droves to be um, monitors for us, um, go once an hour, essentially through, from April to June, once, once an hour and count for 10 minutes. That is, mm -hmm. each person goes for one 10 minute slot a week and we have- So they get a sampling then. They get a sampling. Yeah. And then from that, we estimate the total. Cool. So in, in that first year, it was estimated that 200,000 fish crossed that fish ladder. So there were at least 200,000 fish returning to the mystic every year. Um, but then we watched this play out over time. And the amazing thing is um, that since that, since 2012, the population of, of fish loyal to the mystic river has more than tripled and now the number is 750,000 fish at its height up passing through the through from one lake to the other and this is the the explanation for that is that um so remember that they they the fish return to the the river they were born in so the the, the mm -hmm. fish loyal to the Mystic River, would return every year to the Mystic River, but they were constrained in their breeding habitat. They could only breed in a certain limited area in the river and then in Lower Mystic Lake. By opening up Upper Mystic Lake, which is prime uh, river herring habitat for spawning, it allowed this, this group of fish, this population of fish to expand its population. And by the time those, um, those Juveniles, first juveniles that were born in that first year when they could spread out in this kind of pristine um, environment in Upper Mystic Lake, 
when they returned at age three and four, we saw this big doubling, this big jump in the population. And it, it all the pieces fit together. The, the uh, fishery scientists are confident this is what happened. And, and so can the, uh, go, yes, please. I just had a question. Uh, can the uh, ecosystems sustain that, that level of increase? Well, that's a really interesting kind of lens to look at it through. So a, a couple of things come to mind. So the, the juveniles um, eat, um, so they're, they're, you know, the eggs hatch and the larvae come out and they turn into juvenile fish and they eat zooplankton, you know, uh, very small crustaceans and, and things that are floating in the water column. And Mystic Lakes is prime uh, zooplankton habitat. And um, there's actually a research team at um, University of Massachusetts that we've collaborated with as well, but they're studying juvenile um, habitat throughout New England and including in the lake. And they find that, that there's evidence that in a, in a very crowded lake as, as Mystic Lake becomes because of this huge number of fish that are coming into it, um, they exhaust their preferred prey items and shift sometime in the season to less preferred prey. And there's even evidence that in a very crowded lake like Mystic Lake, because of, again, just the number of fish that we're allowing to pass into it. Um, in these crowded systems, the fish grow more slowly than they do in other systems where there's less competition for food. So that's one- Oh, more. that's, they're, they're smart. Another, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 absolutely. The, the other, yeah. the one in really interesting question someone asked is, so our, the next big target for restoration is to get these fish to Horn Pond in Woburn. That's the next big lake Ooh. upstream. And we see them pooling, they, they wanna get in there. And there's right now very ineffective uh, fish passage. So millions of dollars are coming over the next few years from federal sources, um, uh, thanks to, um, settlements from uh, pollution events in the in the um, Aboriginal uh, subwatershed and um, from an uh, settlement money from an oil spill uh, in the Mystic, money coming to build a fish ladder to Horn Pond. And oh, that'll be exciting. Yeah. It will be exciting. And sport fishermen on Horn Pond asked the question, wait, do we really want you know, hundreds of thousands of new fish into our lake where we're after, you know, the stock trout and smallmouth bass and other sport fish. And it turns out that there's evidence again from this UMass group that if you reintroduce herring to a, a lake that they formerly uh, occupied but haven't been in recently because of a dam, um, the, the abundance and um, fit and condition of the sport fish actually increases. It doesn't decrease because there are now millions of baby herring for those sport fish to eat. So the, the, and so the, I think the short answer to your question is this will help improve the productivity and diversity of the ecosystem rather than um, be a, be a drain on it. Oh, it's going to be exciting to watch. I'm, I'm just so thrilled. I'm, I think I'm going to go volunteer for, for, for the counting if I can, if I'm there? not behind the, behind the curve. But I just want to bring out Patrick back in, and because the herring have created this wonderful event that I have actually participated in, um, and we did, we did also a trash pickup. I think related to it. Is there a trash? Yeah, and uh, so tell me a little bit about how that piggybacked on on the natural run of the herring, and you know, just how that how that event came to be. How long has it been going on, and how important it is is it to your your uh, funding uh, for your or association? Yeah, you know, we have been running a Mystic Herring Run and Paddle event for more than 20 years. It launches from the Blessing of the Bay in May each year. Uh, 
Um, but it runs each year. It includes both a running race, uh, that's a 5K, as well as a variety of uh, paddle length distances up the Mystic River. Mm -hmm. um, and it attracts hundreds of people who uh, come to both enjoy the competition, but also just enjoy connecting with this community. It, it does raise uh, critical funding for our organization. It's unrestricted funding, which allows us to be creative in the future and develop new programs. But, you know, the, I think the greatest power of the event is um, really bringing our community together along the edge of the river. Um, there are so many friends um, and people who share an interest in the river who are able to come together on what's usually a beautiful day and see each other. And more than ever, I think we're trying to find these moments. So this year is a virtual. Everybody has to go out and do it on their own. Um, but we're really excited for next year when we'll have the crowds back and that uh, we'll be able and to get can, uh, Because I'm a rower, does, can that, can I do a, a, a run, a row, virtual row? I think it's appropriate for us to break as many rules as we can. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Charlotte, you should get out there and do, I it, do it right. I don't, um, know, I don't know if you would know my friend, um, Rich Whalen at the uh, Blessing of the Bay, Gentle Giant. I just, you know, he's really totally involved in it, I think. Yeah, Rich is great. You know, um, he brings uh, a lens to involving people in the river and getting people to row who wouldn't otherwise think it's their sport. Um, so he's a champion for uh, yeah. working with both clean and available to everyone to row. Yeah. A lot of Canada geese um, and uh, uh, swans along mm -hmm. the river, but you also see a remarkable diversity of birds in the parks yeah. along the edges of the river. So I see the night herons when I row, and they're, they're kind of like a, a little bit above the river. And then the heron, blue herons are kind of down on the river, and they must be nesting now, right? Very I'll defer to Andy, uh, a yeah, resident bird expert. I think that's right. I the the news that I learned recently is that there are, by all reports, um, two um, uh, chicks of bald a uh, bald eagle pair that have nested in Arlington. That's like really exciting news for um, the, oh. the bir birders among us in the Mystic Watershed. I wanted to ask uh, you, in particular, Patrick, about your since these are all connected ecosystems, you know, I know you have separate watershed, or we have in this region, separate watershed associations, but what, what organizations and, you know, how do you, how do you share information and interact with them? Well, we are really lucky to have a remarkable set of organizations throughout Massachusetts working on uh, improving water quality and improving access in different watersheds. So locally, uh, we frequently are interacting with watershed groups like Charles River Watershed Association, the Neponset River Watershed Association, ORS, um, the Ipswich River Watershed, the Merrimack River. They each have great organizations. And the challenges that each of us face are are nearly identical. We all are challenged by stormwater mm -hmm. and by climate change and how to get people excited about the river. Um, and so, yes, we team up and work on policy together, but we also learn from each other that sometimes mm -hmm. another organization uh, ends up uh, developing a, a, an amazing way to interact with their community or to draw new people into the work that we can learn from. So both at the level of leadership, but also at the level of our practitioners, our scientists, our program managers. There's frequently dialogue going on to learn from each other. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this tour of the Mystic River Watershed Association and the watershed itself. And Patrick Heron, Executive Director, thank you so much. And Andy Rusina, I thank you guys. You're just you know, so important to to the health of this region. And uh, thank you for being here. Well, well, to be continued, there's a lot more to cover. <laughs> Anything thank you'd you so like much. to say in closing? Uh, just thank you so much, Charlotte, uh, for providing this platform. And for those who are watching this video, please come down to the Mystic, uh, enjoy a walk, enjoy a paddle, and uh, we'll look forward <laughs> to seeing you. Andy? Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming. We'll, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>